we're going to be, as I said, in Judges chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles open there now to Judges 5. Let's uh, just commit our Bible study to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the time we have to share together tonight in your house. Bless this time now as we study your word together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. So in our study through the book of Judges, we are going to be looking here at 12 Judges in the book of Judges. Uh, we have uh, made our way so far through the first four. We are still presently on Deborah. And uh, Deborah is the fourth judge of Israel. Remember that a judge during the time of uh, history in, in the nation of Israel that we're reading about here in the book of Judges, a judge was not some black robed official with a gavel. A judge was a military leader or a military deliverer that God would raise up on his behalf in order to lead uh, the people of Israel for this period of time. The book of Judges covers about 400 years. And when we look here at Deborah, we left off at the end of chapter 4, and uh, she still has one more chapter here in, in chapter 5. Uh, her name in Hebrew is Devorah. Devorah means bee, as in bumblebee, not ant bee. Uh, she uh, has a name that means bee, and uh, there are, um, you know, very few women who were ever raised up to lead Israel. She's in a unique class of her own. In fact, she's the only woman that God raised up to lead Israel until 1969 when Golda Meir became prime minister of Israel. So she's in a class all of her own and she has a military leader with her, Barak, and it is somewhat confusing as to whether or not he was a reluctant leader or whether he was passive or whether he was uh, actually someone that God chose just as much as he chose Deborah. Because the interesting thing is, as much as Barak looks like a, a passive guy that Deborah's always having to motivate and coax to lead the army of Israel, he does get an honorable mention in Hebrews chapter 11. In the Hebrew Hall of Faith, Barak is mentioned. Deborah's not mentioned in Hebrews 11. So an interesting period of time in Israel's history, the dynamics between Deborah and Barak. But she is the one that God has raised up for such a time as this. And Barak is her military leader uh, with her. And there are five things about Deborah we noted last week, and we, la we ended with the last one. So uh, the first thing is that she was a prophetess. It tells us in chapter 4, the first part of verse 4. She was also a fiery woman. That's because it tells us in, uh, also in verse 4 of chapter 4 that she was the wife of Lapidoth, but the Hebrew actually is Eshet Lapidoth. Eshet Lapidoth. Lapi, Lapid means fire. So in a Hebrew Bible, the literal translation is a fiery woman. It doesn't say she's the wife of Lapidoth. So it's an interesting translation between our English Bibles and a Hebrew Bible. So I opt for the original language here. So it probably is an indication she was kind of a spicy lady. She was, uh, she was on fire. She was maybe type A, you know, whatever you want to say. She was, um, she had the chutzpah, shall we say that, right? Uh, God used uh, to lead Israel at this particular time. She was also obviously a judge. That's why she's listed there among the judges. And by the way, on the list of the judges um, that I showed a minute ago, and I'll put it back up on the screen in a bit, the capital letters indicate one who was a major judge versus the other judges who didn't really get much attention through the book of Judges. She, she gets considerable attention here, two chapters. So she is a, a formidable judge during this time in Israel's history. She was also a warrior. It tells us in chapter 410, we don't know necessarily that she engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It doesn't say this, but she went to the front lines as Barak led the army of Israel, and she certainly was there to encourage them and to motivate them to fight for the Lord. But it's this last one that we uh, didn't really get to, which is she's a songwriter, because all of chapter 5 that we're about to read here is a song. Uh, it tells us, look at your Bibles there, verse 1, it says, Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam sang on that day. So it's, I guess it's a joint effort here where she and Barak uh, have this song and it is on the heels of the victory that God has given them uh, over the Canaanites. And chapter four ended pretty gruesomely because uh, there was a woman also that God used in chapter four, Yael, whose name means wild mountain goat. She lived up to her name. She took a hammer and a tent peg and nailed a guy's head to the floor of her tent. So uh, somebody you don't want to fall asleep on. You want to keep one eye open if you're in Jael's tent, that's for sure. But um, she did it because Sisera was the general of the Canaanite army and he was fleeing. And so she finished him off. 
And uh, Yael is actually going to get mentioned here in Deborah's song in chapter 5. She gets a whole stanza. So we're going to read through chapter 5. It, it, it's pretty simple. It reads for itself. I'm going to read most of it without much commentary. We don't know what the tune is to chapter 5. It just says it's a song. So put your own tune to it. I personally have put the Gilligan Island theme song to it. <laughs> You know, that's just what comes to my head in verse 2. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly, you know, that's how I'm going with it. But you, you, you do whatever you want with it. And those of you who are too young to even know, what in the world is Gilligan's Island? I mean, for goodness sakes, my middle school youth pastor didn't even know who Diana Ross was. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So anyway, I won't sing this. I'm just going to read it. But it was as a song. Verse 2, when leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from, Mount, from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath. Now, Shamgar was also a judge. He was the third judge of Israel, but he only gets like one verse. But in the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, Yael, this is the same lady we'll see later, gets mentioned even further in this song. The highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. You know, it's interesting. She doesn't, she doesn't say in this song, you know, it's, she's singing this in the first person. She doesn't say, I, Deborah, the prophetess. She doesn't say, I, Deborah, the judge. She doesn't say, I, Deborah, the warrior. She says, I, Deborah, the mother. And, you know, the beauty of just being a mother is what she highlights about her life. There's a lot of things she could say about herself, but it is the joy of being a mom in Israel. It says in verse 8, they chose new gods. And then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the rulers of Israel, who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak, you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges' attire, and who walk along the road, far from the noise of the archers, among the watering places. There they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. And then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. And then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Machir, rulers came down. And from Zebulun, those who hear the recruiter's staff. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As Issachar, so was Barak sent into the valley under his command among the divisions of Reuben. There were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings for the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan, and why did Dan remain on ships? Asher continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardize their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. And so she mentions here in her song the different tribes of Israel. And she says, you know, some were valiant and fought well, and, and others, uh, like Dan, just remained on ships. Uh, they didn't really engage in, in the warfare. But she commends those who did. She mentions those who didn't. Verse 19, she continues, The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. 
Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping, the galloping of his seeds, of his steeds. Curse Meroz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to help, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. And then here's the stanza to Yael. Most blessed among women, Yael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite. Blessed is she among women in tents. She asked, he asked for water. It's about Sisera. He asked for water. She gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg. Can you imagine singing this? You know, she's, I mean, it's uh, not a very joyful song here, but, uh, but worth remembering. Her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She, she split and struck through his temple. At her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. Yeah, he can't move. He's, you know, he's nailed to the ground. At her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. The mother of Sisera looked through the window. Now, this is interesting because, you know, Deborah, who referred to herself earlier as a mother in Israel, she's going to have compassion for Sisera's mom, even though Sisera was a guy who um, came against God and against God's people. And so he dies in battle here at the hand of Jael. Nevertheless, Deborah, out of compassion for a mother who's lost a son, sings about her. The mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest ladies answered her, yes, she answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two? For Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord. But let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. And so the land had rest. Some of your translations say peace, but it's not shalom. It's the Hebrew word shakat. Shakat means like tranquility. The land had rest or tranquility for 40 years. So this ends Deborah, uh, her um, rule or leadership as judge. And again, she is just the fourth of the judges. So from Othniel, who's the first judge, until Deborah, the fourth judge, by the end of chapter four, if you want to make a notation in your Bible, we've already covered 206 years. 206 years. At the end of her rule, because the Canaanites have been defeated, they have this song singing about the victory that God gave them over the Canaanites. Israel experiences peace for 40 years. Now, if you have been here for our study of Judges for a few weeks, you know what happens now. They, they are living in a time of peace. And what happens when they live in a time of peace? They forget God. And they start worshiping the gods of the neighbors around them, the false gods. And so then God brings the foreign enemies against Israel to, to discipline his people. Until then, they cry out to the Lord. Then God raises up another judge, and then they get peace, and thus the cycle continues. And so, this is that cycle that we've been talking about. So, while they've been experiencing 40 years of peace, guess what happens? They, they, they grow lazy again in their walk with the Lord. You know, trials are often the best teachers. But... My prayer always is, Lord, I want to grow close to you and learn important lessons without having to go through trials. <laughs> you know, I'm just selfish enough and, and weak enough to not want to have to learn the hard way. But it is so typical of human nature that we often don't learn the lessons until we go through the difficulties. If we could just stay the course we wouldn't incur a lot of the problems that we bring into our lives when we disobey God. This is the pattern of the Israelites. We need to learn from them. When all was going well, if they had just continued to press into the Lord and maintain that close walk with Him, things would have gone better for them. But because during a time of peace, they got lazy in their walk with the Lord, they started compromising 
Then they invited hardship. And so into chapter 6, we won't get very far into chapter 6 tonight, but we're going to introduce you now to the fifth judge of Israel, who is Gideon. Gideon is one of my favorite uh, people in all of the Bible. He gets the most scripture reference in the book of Judges than any other judge. Uh, Samson gets second place, but Gideon is going to get more press coverage, if you will, in the Bible, in the book of Judges, than all the other judges. Um, his name means hewer, H-E-W-E-R, as in one who cuts something down or one who carves something, chisels something. It's probably because Israel's a very stony place, those of you who have been with me to Israel, you know, um, it probably is a reference to someone who would hew out um, out of bedrock. And we're going to see probably in relation to his skill where he is found here by the Lord and what he's doing. But, but we come now to this cycle and we're introduced to Gideon because Gideon's going to be the next judge that God raises up. But this is what it says in chapter 6. We'll, we'll get a little ways through here and, and at least get through an introduction to Gideon. It says, then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, let me put back our, our cycle. So here you go. They're doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian. Here come the Midianites for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. And so it was Whenever Israel had sown, that is talking about, you know, they're planting, they're trying to glean a harvest here. But every time they had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites, and the people of the east would come up against them. And then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza. That is, that's still the territory of present-day Gaza along the Mediterranean coast. And leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. So pause there for a moment. So here come the Midianites, and along with them, the Amalekites, and also it just says this uh, generic term, people of the east will come up, and they're taking advantage of Israel during this time. Now, originally, the Midianites were friendly people to the Israelites. If you remember uh, your history in your Bibles, when Moses uh, killed an Egyptian, thinking that he was supposed to be the deliverer for the Hebrew people at that time, which, you know, he had, he, had, he had the what right, but he had the when wrong, okay? God had not called him to be the deliverer yet, so he rushed ahead and he, and he single-handedly kills an Egyptian who is uh, a heavy-handed uh, taskmaster whipping some Hebrew slaves. Moses takes matters into his own hand, kills the guy, buries him in the sand, but he has, he has seen, so his cover's blown, so now he flees. And where did Moses flee? He fled to Midian. And he hung out in Midian. It's the, the peninsula, the, the uh, Arab Peninsula. And uh, so he's, he's hiding out in, in Arabia, in Midian, and he has friendly relations with the Midianites. In fact, he finds a wife among the Midianites. So originally, the Midianites were friendly with the Israelites. But at some point in history, they turn and they become enemies of Israel. And now they are full force enemies of Israel. And they are coming against Israel in such large numbers that a little bit later in the sixth chapter, we read that they were as numerous as a swarm of locusts coming across the land. And they're coming here to attack the Israelites. Again, this is what God has allowed because of this cycle of disobedience. Here come the Midianites to get the Israelites' attention. And it tells us here that when the Midianites would come upon the land, that they practiced what we would call in modern warfare, scorched earth policy. In other words, they would come into a region and they would ravage it. They would take, they would plunder and take the crops, livestock, everything, and then they would burn it. They would just burn it so that it would be left just a terrible, you know, barren wilderness in their wake. Those were the Midianites, very cruel people. And they're coming against the Israelites this way. And they are destroying crops and they are, they are uh, taking everything that they possibly can. Uh, they, they are robbing Israel of their crops and also their sheep, their donkeys, all their livestock. And so, Keep reading verse 5, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents. These were, they were typically Bedouin uh, people also. 
For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, there it is, both they and their camels were without number. And they would enter the land to destroy it. And so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So here's our cycle, okay? 40 years of peace, they get lazy, they start um, rebelling against God. God sends the Midianites, here come the Midianites. Now the people are crying out to God after seven years of being oppressed by the Midianites. And it says... In verse 7, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet. Now this is an unnamed prophet. We don't know who this is. He sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, this is what the prophet is saying on behalf of the Lord, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. You see, there it is. It's like you've been rebellious against the Lord. You have not obeyed the Lord. And so here come the Midianites to get your attention. So this prophet exhorts the people this is what has happened. You have forgotten and forsaken the God who delivered you out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery, brought you into this promised land, cleared the land so that you could dwell among uh, the land that God has given you on oath to your forefathers. But you have allowed these pagan nations to influence you and you have disobeyed me and you have forsaken me. So God's going to raise up a judge. And this is, again, number five. This is Gideon. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, not Oprah, okay, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon, here we are introduced to him, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. All right, pause there for a moment, because now we're introduced to the one who will become the fifth judge of Israel, to Gideon. I want you to notice it says in verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came. And as we've mentioned before, many times when you see in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord with the direct article, the, and in my Bible, I'm reading from New King James, it even capitalizes the word angel, okay? Oftentimes in the Old Testament, when you see the phrase, the angel of the Lord, it is what we call a Christophany. This is actually an appearance of Jesus. Remember, Jesus didn't suddenly, you know, just uh, become created at the time of the virgin birth. Jesus is God, he's co-eternal and has always coexisted with God because he is God. And he just simply took on flesh and dwelt among us when he was born uh, through the Virgin Mary. But God has always existed and Jesus being God has always existed with God. And there are times in the Old Testament when he takes on a physical appearance and appears to people before the incarnation through the birth of Mary. This is one of these times. It's called a Christophany. Now, how do we know this is actually the Lord and not just a regular angel of the Lord? Because if you, if you look at the dialogue, we'll just jump ahead real quickly. If you look at the dialogue, when, when Gideon starts to have conversation with him, it tells us in verse 14, then the Lord turned to him and said, and now it clarifies who this angel of the Lord is. This is the Lord, and the word Lord is all capital letters. It's the proper name of God. It's Yahweh. So this is now God speaking to him. It repeats it again down in verse um, 16. And the Lord said to him, so in the conversation, this is God speaking. And by the time you get to verse 24, after this conversation, it says that Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. This is Yahweh Shalom or Jehovah Shalom. This is one of the covenant names of God. And, and uh, Gideon sets up an altar there. Why? Because he's honoring the Lord who has been visiting him in this scene. So this is the Lord. And so it's a little confusing in our Old Testament when we see the angel of the Lord. This is just a regular angel. This is not a regular angel. This is the Lord. And he appears here to Gideon. 
and Gideon is in this town of Ophrah. Now, Ophrah today is, in, is a city in the West Bank. Uh, it's part of the Palestinian territory, and it is called uh, Teba. Teba. Uh, it is about, the city of Ophrah is about five miles east of Bethel, and so this is where Gideon is. And when we first are introduced to him, Gideon, it tells us, is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, this is highly unusual, but he's doing it because he's trying to uh, hide from the Midianites. Um, as we read earlier, the Israelites during this time, they're hiding in dens and caves in the mountains because they're afraid for their lives against the Midianites. And so here Gideon is, he's trying to thresh wheat. Now, normally you would thresh wheat above ground on a threshing floor. And back in ancient times, it was usually a floor made of uh, boards, wooden boards, and then uh, the person threshing wheat would take stalks of wheat and you would either by hand start beating it across the threshing floor, separating the kernels of wheat that were edible from the chaff. Or sometimes they would use oxen to stomp over the wheat stalks back and forth until it would separate the edible kernels uh, from the chaff. And then the kernels would fall down in the floorboards and the chaff would blow away by wind. So normally you do that kind of thing above ground. But this is a time when the Midianites... Are, are attacking you, and people are hiding for their lives. So where is Gideon? He's down in a wine press. And wine presses were typically hewn, thus his name, the hewer, maybe he exactly knew where to go during this kind of a time. Normally wine presses were hewn out of the bedrock of the ground so that you would step down into it. And a lot of times they were terraced, so you'd throw a bunch of grapes into the upper vat that was carved out of the bedrock. You'd step down into it. You'd trample them, and the juice would then spill over into a lower vat that was also hewn out of bedrock. When we go to Israel, you can see different places where ancient wine presses were. And so he's down in one of these vats because he's hiding. So you're, no, you're normally not going to be you know, threshing wheat in a wine press, but that's a place where he can find cover. And so there he is. And he's trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, and he's trying to hide from the Midianites. But how many of you understand, you might be able to hide from the Midianites, but you can't hide from God. And God shows up. And he says to Gideon, and I love this there in verse 12, he says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And we're going to see here in a minute, we'll save most of it for next week. But Gideon is, when, when the Lord says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor, Gideon's like, who are you talking about? Not me. And the Lord's like, yeah, yeah, you. And I love this because you can write in the margin of your Bible, Romans 4.17. Romans 4.17 says that God calls things that are not as though they were. God saw him as a mighty man of valor. Gideon didn't see himself that way. And I love the way that God sees his good purposes through us, even when we don't necessarily see that. And Gideon's going to struggle with this idea how could God use me? And some of you probably have thought that a time or two in your life as well. How could God ever use me? I'm just this. I'm just that. Listen, you're exactly the kind of person God wants. You know the person God doesn't use is the one who says, I'm ready, Lord, because I'm the best thing to your kingdom that, since sliced bread. You know, that's the kind of person God's like, no, thank you. But it's the person who's like, I, I'm not really sure how I could be used. God's like, that's exactly the vessel. Because see, then when there's less of us, then more of him can be revealed. And if we're so full of ourselves that God's not going to get the glory, then God will move on to someone else who's humble enough to, to say, I don't know what you see in me, Lord, but you know, like Isaiah said, you know, woe is me, I'm among a people of, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, but here am I, send me, Lord. I mean, if, if there's something you can see in my life that is worthy of being used, then use me. This is Gideon, and he's, it's a wonderful story of a, of a young man who really didn't see how God could possibly use him to God using him as one of the greatest judges in the history of Israel to bring about great victory for the glory of God. We'll study more about him next week, so read ahead, but it's a great story. We'll talk about Gideon next, next Wednesday night. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time in your word together tonight. Thank you, Lord, for using ordinary people. And we thank you for the Debras that you use and we thank you for the Gideons that you use. And Lord, we pray that you would always be glorified through us and that your kingdom would be exalted, Lord. 
Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for this time we've had to share together. We pray you would continue to strengthen our hearts and glorify yourself through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.